Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Um, very pleased to welcome Dan Gardner here, who is going to talk about his book, which is called Risk, the Science and Politics of Fear. Um, Dan is here, if I've understood it correctly this morning, to tell us that the things we are scared about are actually the, uh, the most safe, and the things we think are safe are the most risky. So to demonstrate this, Dan has promised that he's going to exit the building today by a bungee jump into a pool of molten lava. So we all look forward to that a lot. Um, just a very quick word on the At Google program. In case you haven't met an At Google talk before, um, there are only about five of us who do this, who put these talks on. And we are always looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in any aspect of putting these sorts of talks on the communications or the technical side, um, please come talk to me or Lucinda or um, any of the others who you may know in the team. Anyway, um, enough of that. Please welcome Dan Gardner. Thanks very much. Uh, for the record, bungee jumping is quite safe. <laughs> well, I hope you're all in a good mood because I'm going to spend the next hour talking about all the horrible things that can happen to you. <laughs> and so I'll begin with this horrible thing. Breast cancer. Yes, I'm going to start by depressing you. This is not the horrible thing is your presentation not coming up. Oh, it's not uh, showing up here? How does one do that now? Uh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm going to start by talking about something depressing. The talk will not be entirely depressing, I, I, I promise you. In fact, it will get upbeat at a certain point. I'm going to start with this uh, depressing topic of breast cancer. Uh, it's a very, you know, obviously breast cancer. Oh, there we go. There we go. Obviously, breast cancer is uh, a major issue. It has been for literally decades. Uh, there have been public health campaigns. There have been innumerable media stories about breast cancer. So we should all know the basic facts about breast cancer, one would assume. Right? What's well, one of the most basic facts? Well, here's one. Here's one. The risk that a woman is, is, experiences at particular ages. Okay? This is a really basic question. At what age is a woman most at risk of contracting breast cancer? Very basic stuff, right? We should all know this. So I'll, I'll ask for a show of hands. Uh, is a woman most at risk of contracting breast cancer in her 40s? Show of hands. Nobody? In her 50s? A lot of people. In her 60s? Uh, some more, but a little bit less. In her 70s? Nobody? 80 or above? One. Age does not matter. Everybody else. And now as... You're all clever people, so you will have surmised that I begin my talk with this quiz because it always delivers the results that I need, and the results that I need are, you're all wrong, uh, except for you, sir. There's always one in the audience. There's always one. Uh, breast cancer, as with most cancers, the single biggest risk factor by far, by far, is age. The older a woman, it, woman is, the more at risk she is. It's really that simple. So the correct answer is 80 or above. Now, this is all horribly unscientific, but I can tell you, I've given this quiz to innumerable audiences in multiple countries, and I've always gotten the same response. I actually once gave this quiz to the uh, health ministry in Canada and uh, got the same response, which was rather <laughs> disturbing, really. Um, but this was done somewhat more scientifically by Oxford researchers. They surveyed British women, and they asked them the same question. And in that quiz, 0.7% of women got the answer right to this most basic question about this most important issue. Pretty astonishing, isn't it? It's a pretty big gap between perception and reality. 
And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, is the gap between perception, risk perception, and risk reality. <laughs> Uh, risk perception researchers uh, really got underway in the 1970s, largely in the United States, as a result of the controversy over nuclear power. Uh, you know, nuclear nuclear engineers said this is safe. The public said we're worried. Nuclear engineers said, but here are the numbers. The public said we don't care about your numbers. And the nuclear engineers said, but here are the numbers. <laughs> and it really was a dialogue with the deaf. And so psychologists got involved to try and understand what was really going on in people's risk perceptions. How do people judge what's worth worrying about and what's not worth worrying about? And one of the key findings is that there's these gaps between perception and reality are routine. Routine. And in fact, sometimes these gaps between perception and reality open up into canyons where the gap between perception and reality is enormous, breathtaking. Some examples of these, these canyons between perception and reality. Silicone breast implants. Uh, you may remember, not many people in this room will remember, I suspect, because you're all ridiculously young. But uh, those of us who are a little bit older, we remember that in the early 1990s in North America, it wasn't so much a European phenomenon, but in North America, there was a great, great level of concern about silicone breast implants that they cause connective tissue disease. In fact, the risk perception was so high that women believed that the risk was equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. If you have implants, you're going to die. Right? There was actually surprisingly little scientific information to support that belief. Lots of anecdotes, lots of case studies, but not any really good science. Well, in the mid and late uh, late 1990s, the science started to deliver, and the science was clear. No, it doesn't cause connective, connective tissue disease, uh, and now that's the scientific consensus. So that's a, a great example of a huge gap between perception and reality. Here's another one. The Columbine Massacre 10 years ago. After the Columbine Massacre happened, it was not only news across the United States, Canada, it was news around the world. And there was a huge debate, a fierce, fierce debate in the United States about the Columbine Massacre and its meaning. The debate wasn't about what's wrong with kids, right? What's wrong with the schools? Everybody knew that there was something wrong with kids, wrong with the schools, because school violence was soaring out of control. The debate was about why. Why was school violence soaring out of control, okay? And everybody had their little pet theories based on their ideological assumptions. They all knew the answer. Then the U.S. Congress asked the U.S. Department of Justice to do some proper research on school violence. You know what it discovered? It discovered that throughout the 1990s, throughout the years leading up to the Columbine Massacre, school violence actually wasn't soaring. It was actually plummeting. It was doing exactly the opposite. That uh, research was bundled into a report. The report was issued and it was completely ignored by the media and politicians. Uh, it's now an annual report, incidentally. Every year it comes out and every year it shows the same things. School violence is going down and every year the media and politicians ignore it. Here's one that's much more a European phenomenon. GM foods. GM foods and health risk. There's simply no good evidence that GM foods are a significant risk to human health. If they were, most of North America would be sick or dying <laughs> because it's all we eat. And yet, a very, very significant chunk of the population of Europe believes that GM foods will kill you. <clears throat> now, I'm mainly going to talk about risks of injury or disease or death, but this stuff applies to any sort of bad outcome, including financial risks. Here's another gap, the real estate bubble and home refinancing. Uh, you had a pretty spectacular real estate bubble here. The United States, they had another one. In the United States, one of the great phenomena was this home refinancing. I'm going to refinance my mortgage. I'm going to take that money. I'm going to spend it on a monster truck, a giant screen TV, and vacations. Why is that a good idea? Because home prices only go up, right? So this is actually a low-risk move. Everybody knows home prices only go up, OK? Bad risk perception, okay? Now, that's at the consumer level. 
Uh, we all know that the consumers are uneducated and foolish, so of course they're going to think silly things. But what about those super sophisticated Wall Street bankers? They wouldn't make those sorts of mistakes, would they? Except that they did. Uh, Mortgage-backed securities. Well, that's a fantastic investment. Let's borrow billions of dollars to buy some. And the world is living with the repercussions of that disastrous risk perception. So how do these enormous gaps between risk and reality open up? This slide is my attempt at a, you know, wrap it all up, one slide explanation. <laughs> there are three basic factors involved. And of course, I don't want to be reductionist. There are other things going on as well, but I think that this is an essential feature of what's, ne what's needed for these gaps to open up. Number one, the media. To nobody's surprise, the media play a role. Number two, fear marketers, which is simply my term for individuals and organizations who have an interest in manipulating our perceptions of risk. Very often it's to promote the idea that we're at risk, but sometimes it's actually to diminish the risk, tobacco companies being the classic example. And then of course, fundamentally, what's going on here is psychology. It's about human nature. It's about how we think. And that's what's most important, and that's what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today. Now, very quickly, I'm going to run through these first couple of points quickly because you know this stuff, right? The fear marketers. Politicians market fear for votes. Everybody knows this. Uh, I probably don't have to elaborate beyond saying two words. Bush administration, right? <laughs> Officials market fear to expand budgets. Police chiefs, it's amazing how often they describe burgeoning crime waves shortly before they have to have their budgets approved by city councils. It's an amazing correlation. Uh, corporations market fear for sales. If you perceive yourself to be healthy, you're not going to buy a pill, are you? Right? So if you're working for a pharmaceutical company, you don't have to have an MBA. You don't have to be particularly bright to figure out what is necessary to grow the market, right? Increase the perception of illness. Same with security companies. If you perceive yourself to be safe, you're not going to buy a new home alarm, are you? So what do you got to do as a security company, right? And NGOs, NGOs market fear to advance causes. NGOs are very often, they have better motives than profit-seeking corporations, but they use the same tactics. I mentioned breast cancer at the beginning. In the late 1990s, breast cancer activists used to, there's a figure they always like to promote. It was very widely cited. It said, one in eight women will get breast cancer in her lifetime. Pretty startling figure, right? And if you're a woman, it's pretty frightening you. One, two, three, four, right? But what they didn't tell you about that figure is that for a woman to be exposed to the full one in eight risk, she has to be 95 years old. Hmm? I personally hope to be diagnosed with cancer at the age of 95 because it will mean that I am alive at the age of 95. <laughs> okay, the media. Again, this stuff is pretty obvious. You know this stuff. Uh, the media's fault. We emphasize, and when I say we, I work for a newspaper. That's my day job, opinion columnist. I, I emphasize opinion. You've noticed I have a few opinions. You see. Um, we emphasize the vivid, the dramatic, and the emotional. And so lives lost to tornadoes and terrorism, that's front page news. That goes on the evening news. Lives lost to diabetes and asthma, uh, that's not news, right? When was the last time you saw a story about diabetes killing someone, right? And yet, diabetes kills more people in a year than tornadoes and terrorism combined will kill in all of human history. We're biased toward bad news. Everybody knows this one too. Good news is an oxymoron, right? Things improve, not a story. Things go to hell, great story. Another one. We, the media, right? Man bites dog stories, right? Dog bites man, that's not a story. Man bites dog, it's a great story, right? We love novelty, right? That's unusual, that's startling. Oh, that goes on the front page. That's routine, boring, yawn, moving along, right? And of course, these stories are true, they're all factual, but what's the obvious problem with reporting that way? If you constantly report that man bites dog, and you never report that dog bites man, 
eventually you're going to come up with a pretty skewed impression of canine human relations, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, we present risk information badly. Something bad could happen. How many times have you seen a story in the media in which they say something bad could happen? Start one. Oh, you're right. That is bad. I better pay attention. What do those stories mean? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Something bad could happen means nothing. Right? Right now, it is possible that a jet could lose power in all its engines, crash into this building, and kill us all horribly could happen in the next 30 seconds, right? Are you concerned? No, you're not, because the probability of that happening is extremely, extremely low. Probability matters. Hmm? Pretty basic stuff. We emphasize, we the media, we emphasize relative risk, not absolute risk. Stories are constantly filled with phrases like twice the risk. This is a real New York Times story, by the way. In the New York Times, it said, Women who take this pill are at twice the risk of developing potentially fatal blood clots. If you're, if you're a woman and if you take that pill, you're probably going to find that alarming. Should you? Answer, I don't know. I don't have a clue. I need to know the absolute risk to know if the relative risk matters. If, for instance, I were to tell you that the possibility, the probability of that jet losing power in all of its engines, crashing into this building and killing us all horribly were to double, would you be alarmed? No, you would not be alarmed because two times almost zero is almost zero, right? But if there's a significant risk of developing those potentially fatal blood clots and then you double the risk by taking this pill, you should be worried. You need to know the absolute risk and the media almost never give you that information. We also provide no comparison to, comparisons to provide perspective. Um, even if you're a numerate person, and I tell you that the risk of some horrible thing happening is 1 in 135,000, what does that mean? It's pretty tough to grasp, right? Conceptually, you can get it. It's probably pretty small. Hmm? But if I were to tell you that the risk of your annual risk of dying in a car crash is 1 in 6,000, you say, ah, right. I can compare one to the other because we're very good at doing that. We want to do that naturally. Uh, and I can realize that's actually an extremely small risk and I probably shouldn't worry about it. Those sorts of comparisons almost never appear in the media. And fundamentally, it's about this. This is the problem with the media, lack of critical scrutiny. We don't examine, we don't think rigorously. We pass it along. If the public thinks something, we agree and we pass it along. Now, everything I've said about the media, you all know that. The more interesting question is the explanation for why the media does what it does. Right? The standard answer is to make money or to push an agenda. Right? And what's the agenda? Well, the agenda depends on your own politics. If you're left wing, the agenda is right wing. And if you're right wing, the agenda is left wing. You ever notice that? It's pretty remarkable. Uh, I don't deny that ideology or money, more importantly, play some role at some times in some venues. But I think there's something much, much more fundamental going on in media's behavior, in the behavior of the media. It's simply that journalists are human. Journalists are people. When you go back and you look at media behavior, media reporting, and you analyze it through the lens of psychology, suddenly it starts to make sense. Give me an example. Remember I said, there's a bad news bias in the media, as everybody knows. We love bad news, we ignore good news. Why? Well, that's not a media bias, that's a human bias. There's a huge psychological literature demonstrating that people are biased toward bad news. If I put two pictures up, a frowning face and a smiling face, your eyes will be drawn to the frowning face first, and you will remember the frowning face longer. There's all sorts of research to indicate that. So the media are really just following human nature. Similarly, novelty. We love those man bites dog stories in the media. Well, people love novelty. People love man bites dog stories. We are very much hardwired towards novelty. If I show you a list of 30 words, 29 of which are written in blue ink and one of which is written in green ink, you will notice and remember the one that's written in green ink. That's just human wiring. 
So what's really fundamental here is psychology, and that's what we have to talk about. Now, start with the real basics on psychology. All our feelings and thoughts are the product of the brain, no surprise, but the brain is the product of the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness. The environment of evolutionary adaptiveness is a term from evolutionary psychology. It simply means the world in which the pressures of the environment shaped the brain, changed the brain, made it what it is. What was that environment? Well, here's the history of our species. Roughly 200,000 years, there's a great long line, and then there's today, that little vertical line at the end, okay? The founding of the first town, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the invention of the printing press, the birth of Bill Gates, everything that matters in human history fits in that vertical line at the end. Everything. That perspective is essential to understanding your brain. If you were to write a history of humanity in proportion to the amount of time that we have spent at each stage of development, you'd write 200 pages on hunter-gatherer societies, 200 pages. You'd have one page for agrarian societies. You would have one short paragraph for the world of the last two centuries. All of that boils down to one simple point. We live in the information age, but our brains are stone age, which is not an insult. We often use the term stone age as an insult. That's a mistake. The human brain is absolutely magnificent. It's one of the wonders of the universe, indisputably. But it is a fact that it evolved in an environment radically unlike the environment in which we live. And that fact has profound implications. Now, if you go to a cognitive psychologist and say, start with the basics, tell me about how we make decisions, tell me about how we decide what to worry about and what not to worry about, they'll start with this. They'll start by saying, you think you make decisions by thinking about them, right? It seems obvious. I think, I come to a conclusion, there's my conclusion, it's pretty obvious. That's an illusion. There's much, much more going on. In fact, you have not one mind at work, you have two minds, two systems of thought. And psychologists being the clever people that they are, they have dubbed these two systems of thought, system one and system two. <laughs> system one. System one is the more ancient of the two. It evolved first. It operates outside consciousness. By definition, you are not aware of what it's doing. It delivers conclusions in the form of feelings, hunches, intuitions. Uh, I asked you about breast cancer at the beginning. You said, hmm. That seems right. Where did that answer come from? You had a sense that you knew the answer. It didn't come from the facts because you were all wrong, except you. Okay? So where did it come from? It came from this mind. And it came quickly, didn't it? Right? This is the essential feature of the unconscious mind. It's fast and it's effortless. It delivers snap judgments, which is a very useful tool when you're walking along the street and a shadow moves in the alleyway and you've got to decide what to do, right? You can't consult crime statistics, you have to decide now. Now, because system one is completely forgettable, I call this gut. I call the unconscious mind gut. Because that's how we talk about in ordinary English, right? Uh, I have a gut feeling that something is true. I can't quite explain why, I just have a sense that this is true, gut. Obviously, the other mind, system two, as psychologists call it, is conscious thought. Conscious thought is capable of careful reasoning, numeracy, and logic, capable, I emphasize. Uh, it delivers conclusions that can be fully expressed and explained. If you come to a conclusion by consciously reasoning your way to that conclusion, and I ask you, how did you get here? You can explain it. You can take me through the steps to the conclusion. Problem, it's slow and laborious, right? Conscious thought takes time and effort, a lot of effort. Uh, I call this system head, to make it more memorable, because that, all, that too is how we talk about it in ordinary English. Uh, if, if, if I have a gut feeling that something is true and you think I'm wrong, you say what? You say, use your head, right? You may or may not mean that as a simple insult. If you're being less insulting, you mean it as, hey, stop and think about this carefully. 
which is to say, stop and think about this consciously. Now, who does what? How do the two minds interact? So the first, first uh, important thing to remember is that we are constantly bombarded with stimuli. There's massive amounts of information coming at us at all times, and the brain is processing it all, right? Right now, you think you're listening to me. I hope you're listening to me, but you're doing much, much more, right? You are, for instance, there's ambient sound in the air. Uh, there's ambient scent in the air. There's a pattern on the carpet. Your brain is processing all that information. And it's sifting through all that information. And it's deciding, okay, what should consciousness pay attention to? Hopefully, my words. Right? All the other stuff that you're not paying attention to, it's processed by the unconscious mind. It goes to gut. Now, it's not an even workload. Only a very small fraction of the information processed by your brain goes towards consciousness. All the rest goes to the unconscious mind. You're never aware of how you're handling it. Now, how do you make a decision out of this system? Out of these two systems working together? How do you make a decision? Well, remember the essential feature of gut is that it's fast. In head, its essential feature, or one of its important features, is that it's slow, right? So that means gut delivers first, boom, there's your snap judgment. And at that point, consciously, you can come along and you can examine that conclusion. And you can say to yourself, okay, that makes perfect sense, I'll go with it. Or you can say, that's a little off, I'll adjust it. Or you can say, that's completely nuts, I'm going to ignore it. Right? But will head step in and examine gut, the unconscious mind, examine the conclusions of the unconscious mind? That's a critical question. Here's a way of devising, or a test that was devised as a way of uh, determining whether, in fact, head is doing its work, whether head is getting involved. A bat and a ball cost a dollar and ten cents. As you can see by the sums involved, this is a very old question. A bat and a ball cost a, to a, a total of a dollar and ten cents. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Okay. If you are like every other human on the planet, I guarantee that you read this and you immediately said to yourself, ten cents. Right. Ten cents. Boom. You didn't have to think about it. You just had that snap judgment. Ten cents. But stop and think now. If the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, and the ball costs 10 cents, that means the bat costs a dollar and 10 cents. A dollar and 10 plus 10 equals a dollar and 20. Eh, 10 cents is wrong. Right? Not terribly complicated stuff. You would catch this mistake if you stop and thought about it consciously. The question is, will you stop and think about it consciously? Uh, this question, and many others like it, was devised by a Nobel Prize winning psychologist named Daniel Kahneman. And Kahneman's purpose was twofold. He wanted questions to elicit that snap judgment. You have a strong and intuitive answer. Yes, that's the correct answer. And then he wanted to know, before people write a, or say, yes, my final answer is 10 cents, do they stop and think consciously about that intuitive judgment? Because if they did, they wouldn't say, my final answer is 10 cents. Well, Kahneman has found he's given this quiz all over the place. Uh, in particular to Ivy League students, so bright people. Uh, what Kahneman has found is that typically most people do not catch the error. They say, final answer, 10 cents. In other words, when we have a strong intuitive conclusion that something is true, we just go with it. We don't stop and examine it. We don't question it. That's natural. That's how we make decisions. And what that means is that gut, your unconscious mind, is far more influential in your decision making than you realize. And we'd really better understand how it works. So how does it work? How does it deliver? I mean, here's the critical question about gut. Uh, how does it deliver snap judgments? Why is it so much faster than conscious thought? Well, it's faster because it doesn't survey information, all the information, and it doesn't think about it logically and carefully. Because if it did that, it would be slow. It would be as slow as head, the conscious mind. 
Instead, it applies hardwired mental processes to narrow slices of information, little bits and pieces of information. Uh, psychologists call these processes uh, heuristics and biases. But you can think of them as the toolkit, the tools in GUT's toolkit that it uses for making snap judgments. It's a long list of the heuristics and biases that have been discovered by psychologists. I'll just mention a few to give you a sense of how they work. Here's a really simple and very base and very important one. The availability heuristic. How easy is it to think of an example of something? If you want to know how common something is, you say to yourself, can I think of an example of it? If you can think of an example of it really easily, if it comes to mind quickly, well, it must be common, right? See how simple that is? Snap judgment. And if you have to struggle to think of an example, it doesn't come to mind easily, well, it must be uncommon. Simple. Snap judgment. The great thing about this rule is that it worked really, really well in the environment in which our brains evolved. Why? Why did it work well? Because the only information available to our brains at that time was our own personal experience or the experience of our fellow band members, and there's only 30 or 40 or 50 of them. Right? So if you could very easily think of an example of a crocodile dragging somebody to his death at the watering hole, Chances are it happened to somebody near you, and it happened recently, and you probably should be worried about crocodiles at the watering hole, right? That's an effective rule. That's going to keep you alive long enough to reproduce, which is the critical thing in evolution. Problem. We don't live in that world, right? Our, informi our information environment is radically, radically different, in large part thanks to you know, people who work for Google, I should emphasize. Uh, our information environment is just absolutely spectacularly different. We can have any bit of information anywhere, anytime. I sit down and turn on the evening news. What do I see? Here's a, here's a true story, right? And it's a very typical story. I turn on the evening news at my home in Ottawa, Canada, and I see a story about a boy being abducted, raped, and murdered, by a pedophile in Leipzig, Germany. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible story. It's vivid, it's awful. It's exactly the kind of story which is going to be remembered, right? Now, what do I do with this information? Uh, well, my rational mind knows perfectly well that this doesn't tell me anything about the safety of my children in Canada. I know that pretty good, it's obvious. You don't even need to say it, right? But your unconscious mind doesn't process the information that way. Right? You take your children to the park the next day. And you think to yourself, should I watch out for the pervert in the bushes? Is this a significant threat? Right? And uh, what happens? Your unconscious mind says, well, can I think of an example of a stranger abducting, raping, and murdering a child? Yes, very, very easily. You saw it last night. It's so vivid. It's so horrible. Conclusion, based on the availability heuristic, this is common. Be afraid. And so what do we have? All over the Western world, we have parents afraid like never before that their children are going to be abducted by strangers. Well, guess what? Stranger abduction is real, but it's actually fantastically rare. Fantastically rare. An American child is 26 times more likely to die in a car crash than to be abducted by a stranger. But what are we doing? We're taking our children, we're putting them in cars, and driving them to school thinking that we're keeping them safe from the pervert in the bushes. <laughs> That's primitive cognitive wiring at work. Here's another one. Representativeness heuristic. Psychologists have a real talent for coming up with completely forgettable names. <laughs> it's hard to even say. The representativeness heuristic. Uh, Again, it's a very simple idea and a very important one. Here's a quiz. Again, this is a Daniel Kahneman quiz. How likely is it that next year there will be a flood somewhere in North America that kills at least 1,000 people? Okay. Kahneman gave this quiz one group of people. Go to another group and you say, how likely is it that next year in California there will be an earthquake that triggers a flood that kills mm -hmm. at least 1,000 people? Logically, the second scenario has to be less likely than the first. You don't have to think about that very hard to see that it has to be less likely. And yet, 
people consistently judge the second scenario to be more likely than the first. Why is that? It's pretty bizarre. Why is it? It's because of the representative nurse heuristic, and it's because of the link between California and earthquakes. Nothing says California like earthquakes, right? Everybody knows that California and earthquakes go together. Earthquakes are a typical event for California. And it's that typicality that is triggering your unconscious mind. Your unconscious mind says, hey, hey, this is typical. This fits. And it judges the whole scenario by that typical component rather than thinking about it logically and saying, well, it's a conditional event followed by another conditional event. Oh, geez, that's pretty unlikely, right? Um, our minds are filled with these notions of typicality. We get them from experience. We get them from the culture, right? Uh, blast basketball players. Basketball players are what? Tall. I just had to say basketball player and you immediately see a tall man, right? Um, and so what's happening is that the unconscious mind is using this storehouse of information to judge probabilities, which can often work, but in scenarios like this, it really goes wrong. The implications of this? When something typical is involved, intuition, the unconscious mind, is likely to overwhelm logic and data. You're likely to make a conclusion which is wrong and silly. Uh, scenarios. In the corporate world, scenarios are very, very popular, right? We're going to imagine what could happen in the future. And when you write scenarios, what do you do? You make them really complicated and vivid and detailed. This happened and that happened and, oh, and this connects to that and so on. And people think that scenarios provide a lot of insight. Oh, that helps us understand what's going to happen. Oh, that seems probable, right? That makes sense. But here's the thing. Because a scenario that's more complicated is likely to have, more likely to have one of these typical components than is a scenario that's less complicated, your unconscious mind is likely to grab onto that and say, oh, the more complicated scenario, that's the more plausible one. Yeah, that's going to happen. And yet, if you think about it logically, in most cases, it's the less complicated scenario that's actually more likely. So scenarios are profoundly misleading if you're not careful in how you use them. The affect heuristic. Again, another forgettable term. Affect is simply psychologies for emotion, feeling. Now, everybody knows that emotions can influence decisions, right? Feeling, if you're feeling strong anger, uh, that can sway your decision making. You know that if you're angry at Bob and you're thinking about firing Bob, you should probably go home and sleep on it first. We all know this, obvious. But what psychologists have found in the last several decades is that emotion operates much, much, much more subtly than that. In fact, emotion is so subtle that we can actually experience it unconsciously. And we routinely do experience emotions unconsciously. You're experiencing the emotion, you don't know you are. You don't feel anything. If I asked you, you'd say, I'm cool as a cucumber. But you are experiencing an emotion. Now, because emotion is so much subtler than we are aware of, that means that it's influencing perceptions and judgments much more profoundly than we realize. Emotions, when it comes to risk, it's very simple. Again, it's a nice, simple rule. Emotions drive the perception of risk. If you have a good feeling about something, oh, that can't be dangerous, right? If you have a good feeling, it drives the perception of risk down. If you have a bad feeling, oh, that drives the perception of risk up. Now, in a lot of cases, that's going to make sense. That's going to work. But, for instance, my father and my grandfather both smoke pipe, uh, uh, pipe. Right? So when I, when I smell pipe tobacco, what do I feel? I feel the warm fuzzies. I get a positive emotional surge from this. Oh, I love the smell of pipe tobacco smoke. What is that going to do to my risk perception? It's going to drive it down. That doesn't make sense. There's all sorts of things and all sorts of ways in which this emotional yardstick 
as a decision-making tool can go wrong. One of the most important implications of the affect heuristic and the role of emotion in decision-making is that language is powerful. It's far more powerful than people realize. Researchers, I love this quiz because it's kind of silly. <laughs> Researchers brought together some people and they said, we're doing consumer product research and the consumer product that we're uh, looking at is ground beef. And here is a lump of ground beef. Would you please examine it visually, judge it, then taste it and judge it again. The only difference is, they said in, to one group of people, they said, this is 25% lean cooked ground beef, go ahead and judge it. To the other group they said, this is 75% 75% lean cooked ground beef. Sorry, I 25% fat was the first group, right? 25% fat cooked ground beef versus 75% lean cooked ground beef. It's exactly the same information, isn't it? And guess what happened? All right. The ground beef that was described as 75% lean was judged to be significantly superior in quality than the other. Why? Because lean is good, fat is bad. It's that simple. Here's another one. This, by the way, this study was actually conducted with uh, uh, psychiatrists, clinical psych psychiatrists, so people who are trained in statistics and, and scientific reasoning. They were given uh, a profile of a patient, and they were told in the profile that uh, this patient, uh, if he is released, that 20% of patients like him would be expected to commit a crime of violence if released. And so after reading this profile, they were asked, would you release this mental patient from incarceration in a mental hospital? The other group of psychiatrists was given exactly the same information, except the phrase about his dangerousness was altered very subtly. It was altered so that it said 20 out of 100 patients, like this man, would be expected to commit a crime of violence if released. Will you release this patient? Obviously, that's exactly the same information. 20% versus 20 out of 100 patients, right? It's exactly the same information. And yet, in the first case, when it was 20% of patients, the refusal rate, the rate at which people said, no, I would not release this man, was 19%. In the second case, when the language said 20 out of 100 patients, the refusal rate was 40%. That's a 100% increase in the rate of refusal based on a trivial change in the language. Why? How could this possibly be? The answer is the affect heuristic. The language of the first case said 20% of patients. 20%, what's a percent? It's a concept, right? It's an abstraction. It doesn't have emotional content. Uh, 20 out of 100 patients, okay, what's that? That's patients, it's people. And in this case, the person is plunging a knife into somebody's heart. That's bad, it has emotional content. And at that, it's that emotional content that drove the decision, that drove the perception of risk and drove the decision. Here's another one. Researchers went to an airport and they asked some people, uh, you're traveling now, how much would you pay for life insurance against, against death caused by terrorism? And they went to other people and they said, how much would you pay for life insurance against death caused by, uh, by, by any cause? Right? Now, logically, you know what the answer should be and you know by now what the actual outcome is. Uh, people were prepared to pay a lot more for life insurance against death caused by terrorism. Again, doesn't make any sense until you examine the role of emotion in human decision making. And it makes perfect sense. What's all causes? Again, it's an abstraction. It, it, it's a concept. It, it doesn't have emotional content. What's terrorism? As soon as I say the word, you have images in your mind. That's not an abstraction. It's real and it's filled with emotion, bad emotion. 
That emotion is used to judge the perception of risk. It drives the perception of risk, and that perception of risk changes the decision. You're going to pay a lot more for that because that's bad. Here's another one. This one's absolutely critical. If you remember nothing else from this talk, please remember this, because this is the enemy of rationality. Confirmation bias. Once we believe something for any reason, we will seek to confirm it. Evidence that supports our belief will be embraced without question. Evidence that disputes the belief will be scrutinized, belittled, or ignored. Far more often, it'll simply be ignored, right? And by the way, I would point out that Google, and I love Google, I, I, I use Google about 100 times a day, uh, I would point out that Google actually empowers confirmation bias because once you believe something, you go to Google and what do you do? You type in keywords for what you believe. And sure enough, somewhere on planet Earth, someone has evidence that you're right. <laughs> oh, I knew it all along. But what you don't do is you don't go into Google and you don't type in keywords about what you don't believe. And so you don't get the information that indicates that you are wrong. Really interesting study that demonstrated the power of confirmation bias. In 1979, it's 1979 in the United States, uh, researchers brought together a group of people who had strong feelings about capital punishment. And one half of the group, this is deliberately composed this way, one half of the group believed that capital punishment was an effective deterrent against crime. Capital punishment worked. The other half believed that capital punishment did not deter crime. Capital punishment does not work. At the start of the test, they examined, they asked people, well, tell me how strongly do you believe that this is true? Then they gave them information. They gave them an essay. And the essay was composed of information drawn from a couple of studies. And the studies were contradictory. One study said capital punishment works. One study said it doesn't. And the studies used similar methodologies. In fact, the studies were bogus. They were uh, crafted by the researchers to be mirror images of one another, right? <laughs> Except that one study said it worked, one study said it doesn't. Now, if we process information logically, what should happen at the end of this? It should be a wash. You come in and leave with exactly the same belief, right? It's not what happened. Everybody left more convinced that they were right and the other guy was wrong. Why? How is this possible? Because when they read the information and they came across the information that supported their prior belief, they grabbed onto it and said, uh-huh, yeah, knew it all along. Yeah, this just, this just supports what I already believed. But the other information, the stuff that contradicted it, oh, it's methodologically flawed. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like what they're doing here with the data. Right? And it was dismissed. And so everybody left even more strongly convinced that they were right and the other guy was wrong. Uh, I've mainly been dealing with uh, cognitive psychology. Obviously, social psychology is huge in this stuff. Which of these lines is longest? You're, if you've ever taken Psych 101, you know this is a classic experiment from about 60 years ago. There's a row of five people. Uh, first person, which of these lines is longest? The first person says, line five. Well, that's obviously wrong. You're looking at it, and you're rubbing your eyes, and you're thinking, well, no, line four is longest. What are you talking about? They go to the, person, the next person. Which of these lines is longest? Line five. Which of these persons? Which of these lines is longest? Line five. Well, of course, that's a setup, right? You're the test subject, and the real purpose of this test is to, to determine whether you will go with the false group's consensus. In a circumstance where it's absolutely clear what the right answer is, and all these people are wrong, right? In those circumstances, one third go with the false group consensus. And that's when it's absolutely clear what the right answer is. When the answer is actually uncertain, it was four out of five simply went with the group. So we're a social animal. We're very much inclined to adopt the positions of others. We want to agree. Now, these sorts of experiments are often criticized by saying, well, this is an artificial environment. Uh, it's a university lab. And it doesn't really matter. This decision doesn't really matter. If people were dealing with something that actually mattered, they wouldn't be so cavalier. They wouldn't just toss away their own opinion and go with the group. Well, there's a very interesting experiment, which I won't detail, but it's in my book, uh, in which researchers tested that. They made people believe that there was real consequence to their decision. And they wanted to know, under those circumstances, would people uh, go with the group, false group consensus as readily? In fact, they were more likely to conform 
than before. And they were more likely to be confident that their false group judgment was right. Group polarization, very quickly. Group polarization is very simple. If you take a group you take a number of people who share a belief, but they share it in varying degrees of strength. Some believe it mildly, some believe it very strongly, and you bring them together and you put them down at a table and you have them talk about their belief, you might think that their opinion is going to coalesce around the average. It doesn't. It actually coalesces around a much more radical position. And what that means very simply is that getting together with like-minded folks is a great way to radicalize opinions. Take a few of these concepts and put them together. <laughs> Alan convinces Betty, which persuades Carl, which settles it for Deborah. Right? That's confirmation. Or, I'm sorry, that's conformity. They now believe something. Well, once they believe something, they're going to start screening information in a biased fashion. That's confirmation bias. Well, now they're very concerned. They're going to form groups. They're going to get together and talk about this. And when that happens, they're going to become even more sure of themselves. That's group polarization. <coughs> and now you have a whole bunch of people who are really strongly convinced of something. Well, that's going to convince more people. That's conformity. You see what's happening here? You've got a closed loop. This is sometimes called a cascade, an information cascade. And it's possible that it can go from 10 people to 100 people to 1,000 to a million people to the point where you have even you know, an entire country that believes something that's not true. But will it? Fortunately, this doesn't always happen with false beliefs. Will this happen? Will this information cascade get going? Well, in large part, it's dependent upon the role of these other players. The media. Do the media get involved? If the media pick up on the fact that there's a growing number of people who are concerned, and then they start going and looking for information that supports that belief, because the media are subject to confirmation bias like the rest of us. They'll start reporting that information, and that information, yeah, because it supports the belief, it will strengthen the psychological factors at work. Uh, and now you have stronger psychological factors at work. You have the media on the case. They're talking about the subject. What does that do? Fear marketers get involved. They say, hey, here's our opportunity. And they start pumping up the noise. And once they start pumping up the noise, what does that do? It strengthens the psychology, and it encourages the media to do more reporting because, well, it's a public issue now because all these people are talking about it. Again, you have a closed loop. It goes around and around and around, and it can continue to spiral to the point where everybody believes something that's simply not true. How can we make better decisions about risk? Well, here's one possibility. Eliminate human judgment. Leave it to computers and algorithms. This is probably popular in this room. <laughs> in fact, engineers always love this. I, I spoke with a group of nuclear engineers not too long ago, and they applauded when I put that on. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, algorithms and computers, uh, they often work. They're terrific, right? Terrific stuff. The uh, problem is that they often don't work. Wall Street had lots of algorithms, fantastic algorithms written by brilliant people, and we all know what happened then. <coughs> algorithms ultimately are the product of human judgments. That's what went wrong on Wall Street. The human judgments that went into the construction of the algorithms was flawed, and so the algorithms were flawed, and the world exploded. Okay. So ultimately, you cannot eliminate human judgment from this scheme. So what do you got to do about it? How are you going to improve human judgment? Well, first thing you have to understand is understand the systematic flaws in the information environment. Uh, and I emphasize systematic. It's not random. It's not haphazard. It's systematic. You have to recognize that there are many individuals and organizations who have an interest in your risk perception, and they will seek to influence it. We have to learn basic psychology. It's amazing how I've dealt with corporate CEOs, ministers, deputy ministers, very important people, 
uh, whose decisions really matter, really matter to other people's lives. And a lot of them have never heard of any of the stuff I've talked about today, even though it's basic cognitive and social psychology. I find that a little frightening. Uh, basic psychology is elementary education. If your decisions matter, you should know it. And you have to remember that all the stuff I've talked about today, it, it applies to highly educated, smart people, right? In fact, a lot of the research that I've discussed today was done with highly educated, smart people, where psychologists demonstrated that they are subject to the same psychological foibles as everybody else. Now, people get that in the abstract, right? Okay, this applies to everybody, not just the dummies, everybody, right? It's a human thing. But not me, of course, right? Uh, when you examine your own decisions, you look at it and say, no, I'm being objective. I see the world objectively, uh, and I've made this decision on the basis of rationality. That's how it seems to you. You understand that psychology matters in human decision making to those other people, but not this decision, not my decision. Psychologists have a term for that. It's called bias bias. <laughs> it's the one and only memorable psychological term. Bias bias. Uh, doctors were asked about gifts, free gifts from pharmaceutical companies. Do free gifts from pharmaceutical companies influence the judgment of doctors? A large majority of doctors said, yes, absolutely they do. Doctors were asked, do free gifts from pharmaceutical companies influence your judgment? A large majority of doctors said, absolutely not. Okay? There's a problem there. And that's bias bias. It's very, very hard for us to overcome the notion that we are objective and rational, uniquely among the human race. Here's an example worth following. George Soros. I'm a big fan of George Soros for a very particular and very geeky reason. It's not just that he's rich. It's not just that he's been right so often. It's this. In Earlier this year, uh, he was asked by the Financial Times the question which everybody would like to ask George Soros. George, why are you so good? Why are you so rich? Why have you been right so often? Uh, don't forget, George Soros, you know, he said real estate bubble. He said big problems with the financial uh, industry. And so in February 2009, when this interview was conducted, he was looking pretty good. He was perfectly entitled to say, why am I right so often? It's because I'm smarter than everybody else. But he didn't say that. This is his answer. He said, I know that I am bound to be wrong and therefore am more likely to correct my own mistakes. And if you've ever read anything written by George Soros, you know that this is classic George Soros. George Soros has spent a lot of time thinking about thinking thinking about his own thinking. He's a deeply introspective man. And that is the secret to his success. Psychologists have a term for thinking about thinking. It's called metacognition. Thinking about thinking, consciously being aware of your own thoughts. Ultimately, that's the real and only defense to these psychological foibles to which we are all subject. Thanks very much. That was very interesting. I think we've got time for a very quick Q and A. Just one or two questions. If anyone has one, gosh, we do. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me listen. I expect this may differ from Canada to the US to Great Britain, but I wondered whether you can comment on whether children in schools have been taught much about risk assessment and how to lay the foundations they need later in life to make sensible judgments. Uh, I would broaden that uh, risk assessment is too narrow. Ultimately, it's about critical thinking. Uh, good risk assessment comes from critical thinking. Um, and no, they're not being taught critical thinking. Uh, there are a lot of good folks who are trying, but it's not particularly happening. And, and that's the worrisome point. Uh, if you look at the mistakes that are made in the media, uh, in the public, about public issues, 
very often it's just elementary reasoning would catch these mistakes. Uh, but unfortunately that elementary reasoning is uh, not as probably spread as we might like. actually sort of covered the question I was going to ask, but um, I guess, well, you, you spoke really, really briefly about uh, about Google. Um, I think with regards to um, how by giving more information, you can in some ways, uh, I believe it was a confirmation bias, I think, mm -hmm. was the name of it. Um, so do you have any other comments about how Google um, relates to risk perception, some of the things that maybe we could do as a company to make that work more in our favor as opposed to against us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and by the way, well, first of all, I should begin by saying, uh, I love information technology. It's terrific, and it has blessed human society in countless ways, which I don't describe because they're not germane to my book. But there are downsides. Like every technology since the invention of fire, there are downsides to the, that technology. And I frankly don't know what uh, the solutions are because if you look at the particularly the way online information works the way it allows people to self-select information to group together to confirm what they believe to radicalize all this basic psychology and then you apply it to information technology it all looks like it's it's it's, it's putting our psychological foibles on steroids right you go to political blogs and what are political blogs except massive demonstrations of confirmation bias and group polarization. Uh, it, it's really quite depressing sometimes to see. Um, are there solutions? You know, I don't know. Is to be, I, I have to, you know, beginning of wisdom is, is the admission of ignorance. And, and, and the answer is I don't know. But I do really wish the smart folks who work at Google would actually consider this problem. Because as wonderful as the information technology is, it has its downside. As I said, like every technology since the beginning, of, since the invention of fire, this is not a slight against information technology. Um, and it would be terrific if we were to discuss that further. Um, um, it, it, it sounds like a pretty bleak picture um, with the newspapers stirring people up um, and not encouraging them to think for themselves. Um, for people naturally to be biased in favor of bad news, bad things, gutting to the sort of thing. Um, I mean, we've already, it's already asked about where, where the, 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 where the uh, teaching we could, could sort of begin to maybe lift humanity out of its stone age. Um, um, uh, basically, I mean, is, it, do you see any other way out of it? Uh, <laughs> do I see any way out of uh, billions of years of evolution? Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the, well, the, the brain that we have is the brain that we have. That's not going to change. The information technology that we have is the information that technology that we have. That's not going to change because we all love it so. Right? Um, so what can we do to at least minimize some of the deleterious side effects? Partly, I would say, teaching critical reasoning, which is not so difficult. It has to be an essential part of every educational system. Uh, basic psychology. Psychology is treated as some sort of fluff, some sort of uh, trivial bird program. I don't know, in North American universities, it's very often, you know, if you want to improve your grade point average, you take psychology. Uh, that trivialization has to stop. Right? Cognitive psychology is the foundation of how we make decisions. And if how we make decisions is important, and I think it is, then we have to know something about it. Um, it would be terrific if, for instance, high schools were to teach really, really basic cognitive psychology. It doesn't take a lot. Uh, I just spent an hour here, and I took you through well, several years of uh, you know, an undergraduate course in cognitive psychology. Uh, it would be really terrific if, if people were introduced to that. So you know, I, I don't want to be too terribly pessimistic. I think we can be constructive. Um, I think we'll have to leave it there. So thank you very much, Pan Gardner. <laughs>